I bet that there are a lot of people here uh, who have built uh, startups or have been involved in some greenfield projects. I bet that there are also some people that work for some big companies and uh, used to deal with some legacy code and wanted to rewrite it and refactor it in some modern way. Uh, I can imagine that in both situations, uh, there are a lot of repetitive work that need to be done just before you start to build uh, actual business logic. You need to gather all the stuff. You need to choose uh, wisely the libraries that you want to use. You need to choose uh, IDE. You need to choose a lot of things, a lot of tools that you will be using uh, in your project. I bet that there are people that, uh, just like me, decided to build a framework. I bet that, just like me, you finished with one of the hundreds never ever used frameworks. <laughs> so, uh, we had this similar situation in Allegro Group years ago. We decided to rewrite our application. Actually, it wasn't the first time that we decided to do it, but it was the first time we decided not to write a framework. Hi, my name is Chris Debsky. I'm a developer. I'm an architect, um, and I am a product owner of Service Bootstrap. I would like to tell you all about all the challenges that we had during choosing our tools to incorporate in Bootstrap, about all our pitfalls that we had, and how to avoid that kind of pitfalls. Let's look what we will focus today. First of all, I will tell you something more about Allegro, how, how Allegro was built 15 years ago, how we want to rebuild it right now, where we are looking for new hope. Then we will look how to start in a new world, how to start in a world of services, how to monitor it, how to deploy it, why the cooperation between services is a key, and how to manage the distributed application. The last part of the uh, presentation is lesson learned. I think that will be the most important and the most interesting part for you, because you will see that the most pitfalls is in this part. OK, Allegro. Do you remember what uh, you did 15 years ago? I have one hint. That was the year the Matrix, the movie, entered the cinema. It was way time ago. So 15 years ago, a couple of guys decided to build Polish eBay. And they decided to run it. So they, 15 years ago, they started to build a monolith. And till now, we have the monolith. So Allegro is one huge application that has all, over 10 million lines of code. It's an enormous application, I would say. I would say one more thing. The most of the code is written in PHP. Part of the code is written in ANSI C. Yes, we know that there is C++, but most of our developers want to write it in ANSI C, where the performance is needed. So we have 400 developers, developers, testers, administrators, because we are working in agile methodologies, so we don't divide them into separate groups. Almost 400 developers maintain this application. Well, to say how hard it is to maintain that kind of application, I have one question for you. How many of you 15 years ago, when you watched the Matrix, the movie, know what is TDD, test-driven development? <laughs> yeah, me neither. And so my next question, how many of you wrote a code, 15 years, wrote a test uh, 15 years ago is stupid. So, you can imagine that we have a lot of code that is 15 years, 15 years, uh, uh, that was written 15 years ago, and there is no code at all for this. So, we've been looking for new hope. We have, <laughs> we have application in PHP. So we asked Robert Cecil Martin. Maybe you are familiar with the book Clean Code. If you are not, you have to definitely read it. It's the book that opens your mind. Uh, you know how to write tests. You know how to write small functionalities. You know how, why the functions should uh, be small. Uh, it's a brilliant uh, book. But to be honest, it wasn't enough for us. 
Uh, we tried to uh, build our application in the modern way, but it wasn't enough. So we dig somewhere in this all the blogs, all the documentation that are available in the internet, and we found SOA, Service Oriented Architecture. I'm quite sure you are all familiar with that. So uh, just like we are familiar, but uh, when we came to our business, we had the situation just like on this image. We came to, let's call him Matt. <laughs> Hi, Matt, I will be build services for you. Okay, does it mean that I will have my web pages for tomorrow? No, you will have it f in six months. Uh, okay, so I don't want SOA. They didn't understand that it will uh, is make our work easier, uh, but to be honest, it wasn't because of the business. It wasn't because the business was bad. It was because SOA is not really a uh, well-known uh, term. Uh, Martin Fowler changed the name to this service-oriented ambiguity. Uh, he changed this name 10 years ago. 10 years ago, no one knew what is SOA. For some of the people, it is uh, architecture where you expose your uh, services via web services. Well, almost everyone do that. Is it SOA? Not really. Uh, for some of them, is when you put uh, ESB, when you buy some expensive uh, tools from Tipco, Microsoft, IBM, or some other, it means that it is, it is SOA. It's not, the f it's not uh, all about SOA. For some of the people, it's about asynchronous communication. If you communicate via events, it means it's SOA. Well, not really. So. We had the same situation in Allegro. We didn't know how, uh, how to translate what SOA is to our business. So we asked another guy, Eric Evans, a uh, great book uh, again. Uh, if you didn't read that, uh, you should, but uh, be sure you don't do this uh, on the evening. It's really hard to understand sometimes, but it's really worth it to, to understand. So we ask him to come to our company and tell us something about strategic domain-driven development. And he, but not only to us, to the developers, we ask him to uh, join our business and tell him what is big ball of mud, what is context, what is ACL, why we should divide our application into separate context, and why if we have this huge application with 10 million line of code, why it tends to uh, incorporating these uh, uh, features again and again. Why it's so hard to uh, divide this application into multiple, uh, multiple services. So after this, we had some knowledge on the business side and they knew, okay, we have to uh, divide it. We have to start with the business. It's not the technical stuff to divide application into services. If you start with this, you will finish with the service to send email or to service to generate PDF, or some any other technical services. And this, those services won't have any value for the business. So we, have the, we had the understanding on the business side, so we started with the microservices. I'm quite sure you heard about microservices from Niklas, uh, who had the first talk. So it is quite common right now to gather all the fancy stuff from SOA and call it microservices. About one month ago, um, again, Martin Fowler, he's a really nice guy, uh, wrote a really good uh, blog post about what mi microservice should have. So we, we look at it and we uh, saw that when we divide it with business application into multiple uh, contexts, then those contexts can be independent. So it's like services. If we have those contexts independent, they can communicate only via API, because that's what uh, in DDD is uh, said. So uh, we, we, we started to build services. If we have independent services uh, that can be independent, deployable, the independent testable, it can be also independent built by uh, multiple uh, teams. Uh, if we have that type, we can move from one central database, like we used to uh, use uh, Oracle, we can switch to multiple NoSQL databases. If we want to use uh, RIAC, if we want to use MongoDB, if we want to use Cassandra from, for particular use, we can do that. And what is most important, uh, we move from this 
dump endpoints and smart ESB to the model where we have smart endpoint that know who the customer is and dump pipes. So uh, we started to build service, microservices, but it wasn't really easy. There, were, there are still challenges. Uh, there are still challenges between business needs because uh, they want to have their features ready just day after tomorrow. And there are some needs from the developers because they want to have uh, really easy tools. They want to uh, have it uh, fast deployable. They have to uh, have tools uh, to easy monitoring uh, the application. So let's start with, let, let's finish with this part. Let's start with this new world. Let's start with our services. Let's look at our microservices, how they really look like. So if you think about service or microservice or application, you can think about a really tall skyscraper. You see all this shiny metal, all this shiny glass, etc. But today, this skyscraper is like this white rectangle for me. I would like to focus on all the things that is beneath the, the ground, uh, that is below the ground, all the tools like configuration management, like uh, discover, discovery. Also, uh, Niklas told about discovery. I will focus about, uh, about this. Uh, about monitoring, uh, about uh, uh, log management, etc. So we will focus on all the things that keep our service in place. Okay, how to start with the, uh, with the service? It's rather easy. Uh, we provide all the set of tools for our developers, but that's not all. We provide the sample project that can be uh, downloaded for our Git repository. Uh, it, takes, it takes about uh, 30 seconds to download it. So after 30 seconds, our developer uh, has uh, running project. It is a sample project that has a uh, uh, full fully functional uh, user repository in it. It's rather stupid repository because it, it has just a simple operation like add user, delete user, remove user, but uh, it can be used as a sample how to build application and we'll focus on it. Uh, okay, so we have, uh, we have this uh, repository and we are using Gradle to all the tools uh, that uh, uh, that need to be done with this project. Uh, if you are familiar with Maven, Gradle is uh, rather new Maven. So after just it's actual data after three seconds, again th three seconds plus thirty. After almost one minute, we have running service on developer machine. After just one minute, they can start with uh, playing with this, with uh, running with other application, and with rebuilding this uh, service. And how to build the service? The most important thing for us is to provide really good API. We thought about different protocols uh, to provide. We thought about SO SOAP, we thought about, well, we didn't thought about uh, uh, Corba, because Corba is rather ugly. Uh, well, as well as SOAP, to be honest, because SOAP, uh, you might think about SOAP as a Corba with uh, brackets. Uh, so we moved to, to REST. And how to expose REST? We thought about uh, Jackson, it is really nice implementation, but what is, there are two nice things about it. The first one, it is JSA compliant, so we can always replace it with some other tools. And the second one, it is all about annotations. So we can see that, that under path users, we have method get that uh, sent us all the, all the users that are available uh, in this repository. Uh, we can see that this, uh, uh, ap this application, this service, is exposed with a simple JSON. So uh, whenever we ask, we, ge we get uh, uh, content in JSON format. I won't talk more about uh, REST, because I'm quite sure you read a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot about it. Uh, you know that there are four basic operations, get, post, put, and delete. So I won't uh, cover that more. But REST actually have, has uh, one more operation. Uh, do you know something about patch operation? 
Do anyone know something about patch operation? A oh, couple of you. So patch operation is a partial update. So we can send uh, multiple uh, operations to our object, like add something, replace something, replace attribute in the object, uh, or remove attribute in the object. But unfortunately, it is not in Jackson implementation. So we had to look somewhere for some implementation. Unfortunately, there are not as many as we wanted to, but we found uh, quite nice JSON patch, JSON merge patch implementation. Uh, it is really nice, but there is one problem. Uh, we have uh, implementation from the protocol side, but we don't know how to translate to our developers how to use the patch method. Patch method is not as straightforward as some other, uh, as other methods like get, because get is rather straightforward. You get the uh, object with some ID, and you get this uh, object uh, as an answer. So there are no good uh, examples how to implement it on the service side. So right now we are working with our developers to provide them good examples and good understanding uh, how to work with uh, patch method. So uh, usually we expose our data with uh, JSON format, uh, but sometimes there's some need to uh, provide API versioning of uh, service. It might be easy done by, uh, again, annotations. Here we can see that uh, this uh, endpoint consumes then we can send uh, to this endpoint uh, object in type one, in version one. It also produces in version one, but we have also one more method that produces our content in version two. So we can provide multiple implementation of multiple versions in one class. How does it look uh, on the other side? What is this V2 and V1 JSON? It is like simple content type, like application, vendor allegro.user plus version one, slash uh, dot version one plus JSON. So it's like application JSON, but with the specific content type. And how our user can uh, get this information? Just by adding some additional, con uh, ad additional header, accept, it can negotiate what type of content uh, do they uh, accept and do they uh, expect? Right here, we expect the content with version two, and we get content type version two. Unfortunately, this is with uh, our sample pro project, so there are no users. But we, it is with this project that I run with just under one minute. Okay, there are some other uh, headers that might be used. Uh, sometimes you can see that people add uh, language to the uh, URL, that, like pl.allegro.pl, it, it's gonna be Polish version. It's gonna be en.allegro.pl, it's gonna be English version. But it's rather stupid. Uh, you can also use some, uh, some headers, like accept language, and expose all the content in the same way, uh, under the same URL, uh, to multiple different clients in multiple different countries. Uh, you can also negotiate content, not only with version of the content, like this version one and version two of user, but our web pages are built uh, using ESI. About ESI, I think Vim told you something more, so I won't cover that. Uh, but in the ESI, if we ask the same URL of the service, but we say we accept text HTML, we get content to build the web page. So under one web page, we expose uh, both content in JSON and in HTML. Okay, so we have our service. We expose the data from the service. So let's see how to configure it. We use three different ways to configure uh, our services. First of all, we use centralized Zookeeper, which holds all the configuration for all our services. Uh, it's nice, but it's not sufficient uh, always. So we sometimes give our developers ability to override all the, all the configuration in environment properties. Uh, those are properties files that are separate for the de development environment test and production. And 
all the properties can be also override using command line options. It's not uh, recommended, but it's still possible. There are also four uh, 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 method how to override uh, the properties in application, but we'll cover it during the tests. Okay, discovery. Uh, Niklas told you about SRV records. They are widely used in, uh, for example, uh, in domains. Uh, when you want to uh, connect your computer to your internal company domain, you use SRV uh, records. Uh, so we also thought, uh, what should we use to uh, discover our services? Uh, we evaluate SRV uh, records, but we had some issues with, uh, uh, with DNS servers. So we decided to build the first service that will be used to discover service. Uh, so the first service is actually the discovery service. So user, whenever it wants to uh, get some information from any service, like get user, user, for example, get user, first it asks discover service to locate all the available instances of uh, user service. Unfortunately, we want to expose our services uh, to all the customers around the world. So it's not possible to tell them, okay, just before you uh, ask any service, get all the available instances and then refresh it after every uh, X seconds. So it's not doable. So we decided uh, that we need to have uh, some edge service. It's like a software load balancer, but with uh, specific logic uh, for this uh, for this tool. It needs to discover services with uh, these discovery services, uh, and uh, it needs to uh, pass the query to, to the specific instance. It needs to also offload our services with some SSL tools and authorization tools, but I will cover it later. Okay, so how to feed the discovery service? The easiest way is to provide information about API from all of the instances that we have. We can expose it via standard method like Apidocs. Uh, it is used in some our, uh, other our tools like Swagger, which I'll show you later. Uh, so we have this information about service. It is discovery service, which is used to uh, provide information about uh, all the instances that is live in our environment. Actually, it is old, uh, information because we uh, wanted to build it only to, for the cloud, but right now it is uh, available in every uh, environment. So let's look under these services because here, here hides some API. And when we look at this API, we can find that this API produce, produces uh, objects in version one. Those are objects type dis discovery and it also produces application JSON. It is to have backward compatibility for our browsers. If you ask uh, like discover service slash services, it's rather hard to uh, add some header. It's, of course it's possible, it's all possible, but uh, it's rather hard to tell our business people you will find it uh, here. So it's, uh, it's easier for, for us to expose the most recent version of the object under the application JSON um, content type. So we have uh, services, and under services we have get method, which return all the li all lists of uh, all the services. Uh, we can see that all this uh, data are provided with some annotation that was uh, uh, th that uh, can be seen on the. Uh, one of the first slides, there were like API annotation, which is used here because it's uh, automatically injected here. So we can see that uh, it is get and get services nickname. This nickname is used under Swagger. We are using uh, Swagger because it's a nice tool uh, for two things. The first thing is you can test all the services under the nice uh, interface. Uh, it's, it's, uh, there's no need to uh, build client to all the service just to test what type of data do you get. So we can get just get services. If you uh, 
click on this one, you will have some form to put service name and instance ID and test this, uh, this object. We also use Swagger code again, which uh, allows us to uh, generate automatically PHP code and uh, with some uh, annotation from our side, uh, and allows us to uh, make our developers' life easier to connect the old application, which is this big ball of mud, to uh, the new services. So, if you want to use Swagger, remember to uh, expose your API via documentation. Okay, so we have uh, service running. We have uh, it configured. We have it discovered by uh, other services. So, let's see what happens in all the environment. Oh, okay. uh, here you can s oh. here, let's see what happens in the whole uh, environment. Let's uh, monitor it, let's see the security. So, uh, as I mentioned, we are using Edge Service to uh, balance uh, queries between instances uh, of, the, um, of the service. So we are not using it only for this uh, particular uh, use case, but we are using it also uh, to offload authentication and authorization of the user. We are using OAuth2, uh, which is really nice protocol to uh, provide authentication, but we are not only using it uh, for the user authentic authentication, but we are using it also to service to service authentication. So we are sure that uh, the service that calls me is the service that I'm quite sure it, uh, it is. Uh, because of that, we want to uh, build some uh, throttling, etc., some tools that provide us a uh, uh, possibility to uh, me measure some SLAs, etc., et for between services. So you can see that we are using one single uh, authentication service uh, which is central authentication service, which is, which is really a nice tool. You can find it for Java. Uh, and we store them all the uh, information about both users that might call and service that uh, might call uh, each other. Okay, we have uh, it uh, configured. It would be nice to uh, see what happens in the, in the service inside. So you can, uh, you have two possibilities. The old one is to log into all the servers and uh, tail the logs. But it's rather, uh, rather old school and it's not really, really nice. So we used really nice tool uh, from Elasticsearch, which is called Logstash, uh, with uh, Kibana's uh, interface to visualize logs. And on all the servers that we are using ser services, we installed NXLog, which is uh, Agent that uh, agent router which uh, sends uh, all the logs uh, to a Logstash instance. It also uh, receives the information about logs uh, on UDP port, so it's it's not really reliable, but it's on the local host. So, well, we can uh, cover that, uh, but uh, it is really fast, and uh, uh, that's what we how we connect from the. Uh, from the services. Uh, we have monitoring, but it would be also nice to uh, monitor the uh, current metrics of the, of the application. We are using Graphite, uh, which is a really nice tool also, but what is really most important thing for us, that is, is auto-configured. There is no need for the developer to uh, log into some administration panel and uh, say, okay, I have one more instance of my service. All, all he needs uh, is to put uh, some configuration into his service, and whenever the service is running on additional uh, instance, on additional server, it adds additional field, additional folder under its service name, and it's, it happens automatically. So it's, uh, we offload the work from the, from the developers. We don't want them to uh, build the uh, monitoring by themselves. We also, we provide here basic monitoring, uh, basic metrics from uh, all the HTTP servers. You can see 
uh, max response time, mean response time, response time in some time intervals. Those are typical uh, metrics, but all our developers can provide via uh, annotations some additional metrics. Currently, they don't do that, but we encourage them to, to do. Okay, so we have our service. It is running. It is, uh, it is uh, discoverable. Uh, we see how it communicates with each other. So let's test it. First of all, let's see what type of HTTP server we are using. We thought, well, if we look at the history of our applications, there are some applications that uh, still uses uh, JBoss 5. Ah, cur currently, JBoss 4 is, uh, is not used anymore. But they are using really uh, old uh, application server. So we decided not to go this way, not to go with this uh, heavy and big J2E servers. We decided to go with some light servers. We, first of all, we decided to uh, go with uh, Jetty, which is really nice uh, uh, if you compare it to Tomcat or JBoss. Uh, but after uh, some investigation, we uh, get some information that there is some new tool, which is called Undertow. It is really nice and uh, really fast, but what is really important, it has lower, lower footprint than uh, Jetty has. Uh, and what is really important for us, that uh, it took us just eight hours to change Jetty to Undertow. It was just because we decided to go with standards. Okay, how many of you know what m mutation tests are? How many of you uh, do unit tests? Uh, some of them. And do you test your unit tests? <laughs> okay, that's why the mutation tests are. Mutation tests under uh, test, uh, in the test environment replace uh, your code. Actually, this test under mutation removes uh, some lines. This one actually removes counter decrease and check whether your test will found it. To be honest, it's the nicest uh, file in our sample project, other are red. Uh, in other tests, in other projects, we have multiple tests, but under mutations, we had a lot of issues with them. Okay, so we have mutation tests, we have uh, uh, unit test, and we also provide our developers to possibility to run integration test. Those are the tests that test uh, all the application from the beginning, from the HTTP server to the uh, database, and sometimes to uh, it allows developer to call other uh, other services. Here you can find additional way to configure uh, service. So it, it, it is the fourth way how to configure. It can be override under the tests. You can find that we start our service from the test and we run tests from IDE. So you can use all the debug tools, all the things that you, that you want. If you, uh, if you tr try to do it with Gradle, of course it is possible. You can connect to, uh, uh, to your instance, of course, but it is easier. Uh, it needs uh, much less uh, configuration. And the last thing uh, in this uh, paragraph, we move from developers to DevOps. You build your application, you run it. You are, respons you are the one who is responsible for the application from the beginning till the end. Okay, that's all about services. Let's see on our pitfalls. I think it it's gonna be funnier, at least for me. First of all, we thought about providing multiple frameworks like Spring Framework and Juice Framework. Uh, actually, we provide two versions of Bootstrap, both uh, with Spring and Juice. And then we realized that it's hard to maintain for for us uh, those two frameworks. So the main lesson for me is that. If you want to provide multiple HTTP servers, multiple databases, be sure that you can follow all the changes that are uh, in, the, in the world, in the open source world. Don't reinvent the wheel. It is obvious, of course, but uh, I tell it to all the developers, and then I see some 
uh, monkey patching of HTTP server, and there is no possibility possibility to exchange JT200 because of that. So don't do that. If someone did uh, HTTP server, if you want to change it, contribute to open source. Don't do monkey patching. It's, it's obvious, but a lot of people forget about this. Uh, don't don't do some uh, deny of service to your partners. Uh, we are using Gradle wrapper. It is a nice tool, uh, which the first uh, thing that it, ne it uh, does is to download Gradle. Where? It, uh, where is the um, um, site that it uh, downloads? It is, of course, gradle.org. So on our uh, build environments, on our continuous integration environments, on every build of every service, first of all, we download Gradle. Just to give you the scale, uh, we have right now about 60 services which are developed every day. So we saw it peak on the network, so I hope Gradle uh, didn't realize it. Uh, we told our developers that code coverage of tests are a crucial thing for us. What is the good coverage of tests? 50%? More or less? More. 60? 70? 70. Okay. So our developers uh, thought that good code coverage is 100%. So how to test the class uh, that has just static, static fields and constructor? There is one test on the web that tests whether class is well defined. Really, it tests whether class has constructor. Aren't there any other tools that check whether our code is uh, with good quality? Of course, they are. there are. Tests are not for that. So we decide not to tell our developers 70, 60, uh, any numbers. Do tests uh, in the amount that you need and do only the smart tests. Don't do stupid tests like this one we did. But uh, with this application that uh, check uh, uh, quality of code, there's one issue. Uh, there's a nice application which is called SonarCube, but uh, if you use standard metrics, it, they tend to lie. We have a file that is with us for over 15 years. So it's one of the first files in the whole application. You can imagine that. It's, it has over 4,500 lines of code. It's whole written in PHP. It, there is no objects at all. So I have one question. How many violations are there? 15 years of uh, writing code. We checked it against SonarCube and default metrics, and there was four violations. Actually, the only violations that were, uh, it, were it were a uh, too long file. Uh, SonarCube couldn't read our file. So it just, okay, it is long, but it's not a big issue. Actually, it is a big issue. It is our biggest pain in the ass. <laughs> okay, REST is obvious. Everyone knows REST. So our developers also know REST. So they built API. API, which is called API. So it's rather not REST. But I could give a price to anyone who can tell me what those two things are, X, Y, Z, and one. I can tell that because I'm quite sure that no one can uh, manage it. X, Y, Z is token for BI, and one is magic number. It needs to be there. <laughs> there is second magic number. It's two. OK, but sometimes we have a really nice looking uh, API, recommendation set, ID number one, and we get items from this set. It's, it looks really nice, but tricky question. What one stands for? No, no recommendation ID. It's user ID. <laughs> it, isn't it obvious? Uh, we are also using uh, ESI, so one of our developers decide to use content negotiation in URI. Output isn't parameter of the object offer, 
it is just content that we want uh, to have uh, on our output. Okay, one obvious lesson, uh, design for failure. Uh, it is easy to build uh, synchronous replication between uh, different data centers, but it will fail. So every time uh, be ready to uh, failure on, the, on, the, on any part of your application. And the last lesson that I want to tell you is uh, we started with uh, two developers, with uh, Łukasz Drominski, who is uh, our contributor for the third party company, and with Mateusz Gajewski, who is one of our greatest developer in the company. And we started uh, to build this uh, bootstrap, uh, and now we see that if you don't involve all the developers from your company, you might finish with just one framework that is one of the hundreds framework that are used only in one project of your project and you will forget about this. So the most important thing is use open source, contribute to open source and involve as many people as you can. Okay, so that was from me. Now you have, I think, one minute. I'm sorry for that. For your question.